Includes heart surgery in many places. In some cases, it's separate. And we have a group of, of world-leading thoracic surgeons who are continuing in the tradition set by our predecessors uh, that that are focusing in various aspects of, of thoracic disease and really uh, making a difference along many fronts. And the surgery we do includes lung uh, cancer surgery, surgery for emphysema surgery of the esophagus for esophageal cancer, for heart failure, gastroesophageal reflux, uh, and for lung failure uh, to treat lung diseases, uh, primarily uh, lung transplantation. When, when the lungs fail completely, it really the future is going to be can we repair lungs with regenerative strategies uh, and also develop artificial lungs or bioartificial lungs to treat patients with lung failure. And really, we've stood on the pillars of clinical excellence, research excellence, innovation, and really to strive to develop national and international leadership. The environment that we have here, is, and as you could tell by this wonderful research tower and the research laboratory, really is uh, importantly driven by clinical and research programs funded by the Institutes of Health Research, the Canadian Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, the Heart and Stroke, and other societies. And then also uh, a machinery of clinical trials where we can study in our patients the effect of the new innovations that we develop and partner with, with our, our, our partners and interested colleagues in industry to develop new technologies and new drugs so that we can move things forward. And most importantly is the philanthropic support this has been increasingly important to us. Uh, funding from the government and from the Institute of Health Research and so on really, on average, provides 60 cents to the dollar. So if you're really going to change the world and move quickly uh, and be nimble in your ability to apply innovation rapidly, you really need to be able to have your own funds to run with an idea. And the ex vivo system is, is a, a one uh, example uh, where the, the philanthropic funds and industry partnerships that we developed allowed us to move ahead of everybody in the world and really make a difference quickly. So I'd like to tell you about the Toronto story of lung transplantation, give you a little bit of a history of lung transplantation here and, and in the world, and how this il illustrates the bent to bedside and back uh, 
story of translational research. So what, what I'd like to do is uh, talk to you about the um, history of lung transplantation and uh, the Bench to Bedside Research Program and how uh, research improves clinical outcomes and then go on to new frontiers in lung replacement therapy. So um, the first report of the technique of lung transplantation in a dog uh, was reported by Metcalf in 1950 in France. And it wasn't until 1963 uh, until James Hardy uh, tried to uh, perform a lung transplant in a patient in Jackson, Mississippi. That was not successful, but it was the first attempt at trying to do this in human beings. And from 1963 to 1983, 40 more attempts were made worldwide to try and transplant the human lung clinically, and all of them were unsuccessful. In 1983, Joel Cooper uh, performed the first uh, single lung transplant in this patient, Tom Hall, uh, here at Toronto General Hospital. And Tom was very much like Merv in the sense that when Joel approached the patient and said, you know, this has been tried 40 times, it had actually been 39 times, it had been tried 39 times before and no one has been successful. And, and Tom Hall answered, I would like the privilege of having the opportunity to be the 40th patient. And that kind of bravery uh, allowed the team to pull that off. The team here uh, again went on to, to do the world's su first successful double lung transplant, replacing both lungs at the same time. And uh, I had the privilege of being subbed in on that operation as a medical student, and, and that uh, miracle had a major impact on me and my career, as you will see. Now at that time, Lung transplantation really was an incredible adventure. We quoted a 50% mortality. That means a 50-50 chance that you'll get out of the operating room. And truly in those days, in the, in the 80s and early 90s, the mortality was 50%. And the patients were so sick that the surgical team took shifts of 12 hours, sleeping in the bed next to the patient in the intensive care unit, to look after them because they were so unstable. And we got through that period over time and at that time slowly increased the number of transplants we do per year uh, trying to um, save patients with end-stage lung disease. At that time, many of the patients were American that, uh, because there were no lung transplant programs anywhere else in the world and they came to Canada to, to uh, receive this pioneering therapy. At that time, we, we, our biggest problem was really technical. How do you do this operation? How do you hook up the airway, the pulmonary artery, the artery to the lung, the veins to the lung, and have this work? And the biggest problem is the airway connection. That's the vulnerable part for the lung transplant. So we had a model in, in dogs and pigs, and this is what I studied in my master's thesis with Dr. Cooper in the lab, which is just uh, the building behind you, the old uh, uh, Charlie Conifer wing where our labs were before we got these beautiful facilities. And what, what you could do is you hook up the airway, the artery, and the vein on, on a transplanted lung, and then we put these little cups on it so that after you perform the transplant, you put some saline in there and you blow up the cup and it can turn off the lung. So you can turn off the native lung or turn off the transplanted lung and you could study the function of the lung. And this has been a very important model for us to figure out how to make a lung work after transplantation. And the important thing at that time was, was really to make the lung work after you put it in because after you do a lung transplant, the lung has to work. If it doesn't work, your patient will die. There isn't dialysis to keep you going and so on. So we had to figure out a way to make lungs work. And one of the first uh, pieces of work we did was develop the LPD solution. And if you just focus on this graph here, this is the current standard of, of solution, urocollins that have been used for kidneys. And this shows the function of the lungs when you first put it in, which is quite bad, a, a, a very low level of oxygen and 100%. But it usually recovers by three days. 